Welcome to Respond to Resilience. I'm David Dashinger. In this episode, we'll be speaking with Chief Bobby Halton about leadership, cancer, and the fire service, and probably a whole lot more. Remember to catch all our episodes on YouTube, Respond to Resilience, Respond to Wellness Inc. on Facebook. We're on bbsradio.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and the website is respondertv.com. We'll be right back to speak with Chief Halton after this. In this family, more of us die by our own hands than by the hazards of the job. In this family, up to a quarter of 911 dispatchers have symptoms of PTSD. In this family, our mental health and wellness are in crisis while responders are quietly suffering. In this family, many struggle with job-related stress, burnout, trauma, sleep disruption, substance abuse, and marriage problems. In this family, no one is alone. Welcome to Respond to Resilience. So we'd like to welcome Chief Halton to the show. He's uh, currently Editor-in-Chief of Fire Engineering, and he's Education Director at FDIC. Chief's a native New Yorker. we got to give a plug to New York. And uh, he began his career in structural firefighting in the Albuquerque, New Mexico Fire Department. He rose through the ranks to include Chief of Training. Bobby was Chief of Operations until his retirement from Albuquerque in 2004, then became Chief of the Coppell Texas Fire Department, and then left there to assume duties as Editor-in-Chief of Fire Engineering Magazine. Welcome to Respond to Resilience, Chief. Thank you very much for having me, Dave. I I greatly appreciate that. And just a couple other things. I run FDIC, GEMS, Firefighter Nation, Fire Operations Emergency Equipment. Don't really run them, but I work with the teams. I think, you know, from a leadership perspective, run is kind of a stupid word because basically I'm part of a team that produces those things. And Mm -hmm. and probably um, like most people, um, it's I, I feel incredibly indebted to the folks that really do the heavy lifting, the, the hard work, and and I benefit greatly from their endeavors. So, um, especially FDIC, uh, if you look at that as a model for um, leadership or uh, or production of a major event, we use a Type Three Incident Command System. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, the IFD basically manages that. We have a planning section chief. We have an operations section chief. We have a, you know, communications section chief. We have a logistics section chief. And um, basically, I do the commander's intent, and then I just check with them. And those men and women, they get it all done. And what we do is provide um, direction. In other words, I want it to look like that, or I want us to try to achieve these goals and how that, I'm going to turn this off. I apologize. I'm on a, I'm, I'm currently on a bidding website for a 1966 BMW I was telling Dave about with a sidecar. So I'm going to, uh, yeah. Still- and, and like I told you, Dave, it's 10 minutes out. So it's bumped up to eight grand already, which is out of my price range. So I was going to try to get it for under eight grand guys. And uh, it's going to, this bad boy is going to jump into the 15, $16,000 mark pretty quick here. So I'm out. <laughs> but uh, I apologize for that. But in terms of um, you know leadership and resiliency, I think the best way to help people be resilient is to empower them, right? Operationally, socially, um, and and I mean, really, it, it, people use words like empower a great deal. But I mean, don't look over their shoulder. Don't you know? Don't micromanage. Don't. Uh, you know, and, and then don't complain if you don't like the way they got something done, which is the hardest part. And I wish I was better at that. But uh, so I think um, I, I'm, I'm very uh, grateful uh, for the men and women at FDIC for uh, helping me understand that system even better than I did. You know, I did all my ICS training. I had the great opportunity to work with the Great Basin team on a, a you know, years ago. Um, learned a lot from them, but the FDIC team uh, and every level, every every aspect of the um, group has has a different um, mission, goal, operational modality, if you will, uh, schedule, and working working with that system will really help you kind of figure out where how you fit best, right? Because uh, and and what style fits best you know, we're going to talk about leadership today and um, context and style 
uh, are important. Yeah. Right. And even when you drop into the uh, emergency uh, modality where it becomes more dictatorial, right? You just mm -hmm. give commands, give orders, you know, how you do that um, and how you speak to people, uh, you know, the, in, in the military, uh, the term is you take the base out. In other words, if you're talking to green recruits, you know, probies, you put that base in your voice, you know, you, you go deep, you know, to let them know that you're a serious person. But when you're talking with peers and you're talking with men and women with experience, you take the base out, you know, you don't, you don't need to do, use all the affects and all of the uh, nuances that, that you uh, accumulate over time uh, to project to them. You can be more natural, if that makes sense. And, and, and I like that about the, the ICS system. I think in terms of leadership, it's a tremendous asset. What a testament to that system that you can apply it to an a event like FDIC and it works so well. Yeah. And I think, you know, when we talk about the ICS system and leadership, I think in some ways we may have um, overthought it. In some ways, there are some people that are so ideological that, you know, if you say the third floor, they go, that's the third division. Oh, okay. I'm pretty sure most of us can follow third floor, third division, you know, pretty seamlessly, right? You mm -hmm. know, um, I, I don't think people have to, I don't think you need to overthink it. You know what I mean? And, 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 and God bless the folks who do. I mean, I, I had no truck with them. I'm not, you know, I'm one, one of my best friends in the whole world, Anthony Castros. I, I mean, he, I, he's a high priest in the, in the, in the world of ICS. He's, I, I think he's a cardinal. He, he may be a bishop. I don't know. Um, but he's a, and he's wonderful at it. And so that all of that comes rather naturally to him, but not to me, you know, I'll drop back into third floor, you know, uh, back of the building, you know, Hey, you guys in the back of the building, you know, they know who they are, you know? Sure. Uh, sure. Chief, I think you mean that's the <laughs> C division. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 It's fun having the, having labels for stuff. Yeah. Um, well, Talking about leadership, I was reading something you wrote about leadership. You said, um, we recognize that leaders are the people who spring back after a setback, who accept alterations with grace, and who will view roadblocks as opportunities. So what um, what are some of the personalities that firefighters have that you've encountered that sets them apart as leaders? Wow, that's a that's a great question. I, I think just that, and obviously your your podcast is called you know Respond to Resilience, and and bouncing back is about resiliency, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what do you learn from it, right? Like uh, we've all been to jobs, whether it's a fire or extrication, where in hindsight we say, well, you know, if we had done this, right? Now, what you have to be careful about with that fifty fifty hindsight is that you may be wrong. You know, you don't have a crystal ball, you know. And in scenario planning, it just provides you with another alternative, which is a good thing. The more alternatives you can think of, the better, right? Right, right. So in terms of resiliency or setbacks, it gives you an opportunity. I think it was, a, I want to say it was um, maybe Edison who said that, you know, that somebody said they did 10,000 light bulbs before his worked, which interestingly enough, if you want to read a good book on it's called the evolution of everything by a fellow named Matt Ridley, Matt Ridley, the evolution of everything. And in that book, uh, Matt, uh, who's also in the house of Lords in England, Matt, uh, shows how Edison along with about five or six other, uh, inventors around the world, all invented the incandescent light bulb at about the same time hmm. within some, within a few days of one another, maybe a few weeks or whatever. But remember the world back then communication was much slower. So who actually nailed it first? But everybody was dealing with vacuums. Everybody was dealing with filaments. Everybody was dealing with electricity. So all of the elements for that to come together existed. Now, obviously, in America, we go with um, um, Edison, which is fine. Um, but other places didn't. You know, they, they went with someone else. And so Edison said that's 10,000 opportunities to learn, right? 10,000 opportunities to maybe get it right. And, and he's right. The problem for us in the real world is we're not building light bulbs. Uh, we're, we're, we're putting ourselves into high risk, highly dynamic situations um, where uh, people who study that kind of things, I call them critical natural boundaries, right? Um, if you read people like James Glick and mm -hmm. what he says is really, uh, um, really important for, for firefighters to understand 
he says that strange things happen on the boundaries, right? So although we might be looking at a building and we're seeing some smoke condition that would lead us to believe that maybe a backdraft was going to occur or something like that, pushing smoke, the building breathing, that may not be the case. You know what I mean? Or that may not be present. And suddenly you experience a major backdraft or smoke explosion or whatever. Um, so, you know, there's that side of it. But in terms of resiliency and um, being able to come back, I think that's the the story of our lives, right? You you wake up in the morning, you plan your day, and then your day happens. And uh, I, I love the old uh, preacher line, you know, you want to make God smile, tell him your plans, right? Um, because we don't know what the day is going to bring or what opportunities the day is going to bring. If I can share my experience and help just one person or help one person help somebody else, that's what it's all about. We're trying to break down the stigma. We're trying to share that there are great, effective resources out there. Vulnerability is, is a strength. It's not a weakness. What I've heard from all of the subjects in my film is that I think my story can help someone else. And as police officers, we always want to go in, see problem, fix problem. And you can't do that with a mental health crisis. You have to see person and connect with person. This sucks, but I'm going to have to embrace this suck. You know, I don't like these cards, but these are the cards that I've been dealt, and I'm going to have to play them to the best of my ability. And I've been trying to do that for the last 10 years. Dave and I just got off of a wonderful webcast by Oren Breeze, who did a marvelous job. And neither of us planned on doing that today. It, it just came up in my calendar. So I jumped on it. I mentioned it to Dave. And Dave jumped on it. And we're both so much richer for having been on that webcast. Oren did an amazing job and, and made us think in, in ways that um, maybe we hadn't thought before, you know, uh, gave us ideas that we hadn't had constructs. And, and so... I think that's part of resiliency, right? Like, okay, it didn't work out, but you're still open to trying to get there. But what's the path, right? What's the path? And I think firefighters um, early on learn that we don't win all the time. Um, and I think that's part of what we have to make really clear um, to all our recruits that, uh, we don't win all the time. Sometimes, you know, the car accident's worse than, than we can, you know, extricate. Sometimes the fire claims the victims before we get there. Sometimes, you know, uh, the, the, they're just not su survive. You know, sometimes the, the person who had the massive heart attack had the massive heart attack and, you know, nothing is going to change that. So I, I think that um, accepting that, Life is a wickedly complex, dynamically difficult event um, is necessary. Um, there are people out there who will tell you that they can um, have answers, right? That they know what needs to be done or uh, in particular, uh, I was looking at some politician right now is on the television uh, above me yelling that, you know, uh, all you need to do is ban guns and we'll have no more you know, murders in this country. Well, you might want to check out with the L.A. cadets who were run over by a car or, or the kids in Idaho who were stabbed to death. And so, you know, the, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember who it was, but someone once said it was Burke. He said, cherish those who seek the truth, but beware those who find it. Right. And so resiliency and failure is about seeking the truth, how to get something done, how to complete something. Okay. It didn't work. Probably one of the best examples historically for us, a, a man we all admire is right over my shoulder, Abraham Lincoln. Hmm. Abraham Lincoln failed at just about everything he ever did. And he was in Congress for, I believe two or three terms before he ran for president. And, and then lost the re-election bid or something like that. I, I, I'm, I'm murky on it at the moment, but um, so, but he didn't quit. He didn't, you know. He, oh, they, I, I didn't win. I'm, I'm going to take my, you know, ideas and go away. No, he, you know, he kept going, you know, and 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 turned out to be probably one of the most important men who's who's ever existed in terms of keeping our union alive and all the good that came from our union being alive. 
And, and clearly, perseverance and being to get up after an obstacle was part of it. How do you teach that? I don't know. Um, but I think that maybe you do it by letting, letting the men and women who you work with fail from time to time, letting them do it wrong. It, it, when it's, and, and again, please understand, I'm not saying what, you know, when it's consequential and administering narcotics, you know, on a, on a, on a cardio, I, but, but you know what I mean, Dave? I mean, in, in maybe in small ways, right. Pick and choose the situations where you can give your, you can delegate a situation to somebody to, to win, to lose, to fail, to learn something from it. That's um, probably what you're meaning. Yeah. You know, I, te I, I do a lot of classes. I travel and teach and do a lot of training for a living. And every now and then I'll come up with a new program. And my biggest flaw is I try to shove 10 pounds of sausage in a five pound bag, you know, and I don't have enough time. So I find myself going over things way too quick, hmm. you know, and so I'm stealing from my audience, the chance to really understand what it is I want to talk about, because I'm worried about not getting out all the stuff that I think they want to hear. And, and sometimes you just need to, as the kids say, slow your roll. You know, you just need to say, okay, I'm here. This is what I'm going to talk about and, and let the class go where, where, where the class is going to go. And last week I was in, um, where the hell was I? I was in Ohio uh -huh. at the EMS Chiefs Conference, and I hit two for three. Uh, two of my talks were wonderful. The third one, I got caught in that trap where it was a brand new talk, and I steamrolled them. You know, I just I had I had more than I could cover in ninety minutes for that talk. I probably needed four hours, but I was passionate about it, and and uh, could have done better. What did I learn from it? I'm getting ready to go to Hawaii in a, a couple of weeks to to do. Uh, two very similar talks and I'm going to really roll it back. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to force myself to slow down. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to put in, I'm going to put in bumper guards. Right. So I learned, I, I, I screwed up and I learned okay. and uh, that's okay. That's really okay. It's part of what I've always found fascinating about the fire service is we, we can work in two different modes. One is we can try things out. We can train, we can, train each other, um, do scenarios. We can say run events for the union or for the firehouse. And then we have those moments when we absolutely want to get it right because we don't have the opportunity to, you know, at least in our eyes and probably the public's eyes, we don't have that option to fail. We're there to solve the problem as quickly and efficiently as possible. And it's, I don't know if there's another job out there where you have that. Uh, law enforcement, hmm. military. And even if you think about the docs, uh, you know, a, a surgeon going in, he thinks he knows what he's going to find. But when they really get in there, oftentimes they find stuff they didn't expect, especially the, uh, the trauma guys and gals. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, think we're, I think there are a lot of professions that we share uh, similarities to. Um, and, and, a, and in a lot of ways, we're, we're unique, which is, which is great, you know. Um, and, and uh, I don't know how I got there, but <laughs> <laughs> well, let me take you to uh, this question, because um, I think it also has to do with resilience. What does the phrase, uh, the privilege of being an American firefighter mean to you? Oh, wow. Uh, 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 <laughs> man, you're worse than my mom. You actually read those things. <laughs> um, so what I mean by that, what I meant by that, uh, it is a privilege to be an American firefighter. It's not a right. It's not a, it's not just a job. It's a privilege. It's an absolute privilege because um, let, let me just Victor Frankel, it, it, a very, very important book. It's called man's search for meaning. And Dr. Frankel was a man who worked with women who had suicide ideation back in the 1940s. He was a Jew living in Germany and um, he saw Hitler coming and all that bad stuff. He got a visa for his wife and he to emigrate to the United States. And at the last moment, he came across the Ten Commandments and he read, honor thy mother and father. And he realized he couldn't leave mom and dad behind. So he stayed knowing full well that the Nazis were murderous, evil, horrible people who were creating through mass formation psychosis, um, the uh, foment of popular opinion 
painting them as evil and bad and and the cause of all the problems in Germany. So he knew he knew bad times were coming for Jewish people. And yet because his parents were there, he stayed. And so a phenomenal, phenomenal book, very short book, very easy to read. He ends up being uh, incarcerated in a, in a, a prisoner, a, 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 an extermination camp, yeah. um, uh, along with his entire family, his mom and dad uh, and his wife, everybody. He, everyone dies except he and his sister. And his last camp was Auschwitz. Yeah. But what was interesting, he talks about the folks who survived and the folks who didn't survive. And Frankel survived because he was able to do things for others. He always focused on trying to help the other prisoners to not become uh, focused on just themselves and their predicament. Because when it's all about you, you can quickly lose hope. But when it's about you doing for others, you have purpose. Like even Dave being kind enough to ask me to ramble on, uh, you know, for an hour with him on this podcast. That's a tremendous uh, privilege. It's a tremendous opportunity. It's a tremendous, uh, gives you a tremendous sense of purpose. Dave doing this show for everybody else gives him a tremendous amount of purpose. And when you think about it, being a firefighter, someone's going to call who doesn't know what else to do, but to call you. And it could be the dumbest thing in the world when you get there, a, a kid with their hands stuck in the ice maker or the refrigerator or some silly thing that <clears throat> all they need to do is put a little Crisco oil or something on the hand or whatever. Right. But to them, it's an emergency hmm. and it gives you an opportunity to do something for them, which is the greatest privilege in life. Another great, very, very short book. And I'm recommending very, very short books right now. It's called Leadership and the Art of Self-Deception. And it's by the Arbinger Institute. And they have a follow-up book to it called The Anatomy of Peace. But Leadership and the Art of Self-Deception. You can read that and Man's Search for Meaning in an afternoon. In, 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 in two hours, you could read both those books cover to cover. Uh, uh -huh. But what you discover in, the, in Leadership and the Art of Self-Deception is where we start to have problems is when we don't honor these kinds of requests. When we, when we take someone's request for our help as being below us or not really serious, like I've got a very small little silly pickup truck called a Maverick. It's a grandpa pickup truck. It's not really a pickup truck. It's just a, a car with an open bed in the back. Yeah. But nonetheless, occasionally someone asks me, hey, you give me a hand picking up some concrete or whatever. If, if I BS them and say no, yeah, I, I, because I just don't want to. In my mind, I'll start to come up with all kinds of great reasons why. You know, Dave is always asking me for help. He could, his brother-in-law has a truck. He could ask him. To, he could, Dave could put those sacks of concrete in the trunk of his car. Why does he need my truck? Dave's always, you know what? Dave is, it really, Dave's the problem. No, Dave's not the problem. I'm the problem. All Dave said was, hey, mind giving me a hand picking up some concrete, right, with your with your silly little truck. And, and all I had to do was say, y you bet, Dave, I'm in, right? But I didn't, right? And, and it, it could be your wife asking you to do something with the kids. It could be one of your kids asking you to go somewhere. It could be, it could be the chief saying, hey, Dave, would you mind, you know, uh, uh, square and B shift away on um, uh, multiple advantages and pulleys. The, the guy was supposed to teach the classes out. I know you're pretty good at it. You know, if you say, happy to do it, boss, you got it. Man, you feel great about yourself. You go on about your day. But if, you know, say you had planned on, you know, a different kind of day, and you were just having a bad hair day, and and you you, you said you know uh, no you know boss uh, me and the guys from twenty six and thirty seven we're meeting and we got a really important building we want to inspect and whatever and and, and you say no later on in the day it's going to be you know I'm a pretty important guy the chief ought to check my calendar once in a while it's not always about him and besides Cahill he's always ducking those classes he you know, he shouldn't even be the chief in charge of tech he shouldn't even be our technical rescue guy I'm better than Cahill and, and so. We're never the bad guy. We always tend to judge others much more harshly than we judge ourselves. And so, you know, we're never the bad guy. When if you really think about it, yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm not saying there aren't bad guys out there. There are you know, bad guys, bad gals. They're out there. 
Um, and most of them are in elective office, but the, I'm just, it's a joke. Don't lose your minds over it. <laughs> but if you're an elected official, um, but you deserve it anyway. Um, if you can't take a joke, I'm not your guy. And, and that's the other thing, Dave, I wanted to talk to you about briefly because it came up, Jordan Peterson was talking to um, someone the other day and Peterson actually has a new book coming out and he, he brought up a really important topic. And I thought it's really going to resonate with you and, and your listeners about resilience, mm-hmm. playfulness, playfulness. Firefighters are playful. And if you talk about resilience and why we're so resilient is we're kind of playful. You know what I mean? We kind of approach everything like a game. You know what I mean? We, we, t- we enjoy what we do, you know, uh, e- even mowing the lawn. Most firefighters I know dig the poop out of mowing the lawn. You know what I mean? Out of trimming those shirts. Look at, look at the edging on that bad boy. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's a I mean, meticulous attention to detail too, right? The relentless pursuit of perfection, right? The small <laughs> stuff does matter, right? The, you know, uh, remember when you're getting ready for inspection and, and the chief was coming and, you know, you, you take every dish, every plate out of those cabinets. You, every corner was wiped down. The, you know, you found, schmegma that had been there for 20 years you're so proud of yourself that, you know you not only clean the blinds you clean the lanyards on the blinds you know you you tore it up baby you know what i mean and then if the chief comes and he just walks through and says yeah everything looks good guys uh, you know let's uh, let's have a cup of coffee <clears throat> you feel cheated right but if that chief goes and says hmm the lanyards are, oh uh, good job look at that uh, well look at these cabinets oh holy man uh, nice job oh this is Oh, okay. Hey, you know, oh man, somebody put a little bit of a of a, what's that stuff? Uh, armor all on the tires or whatever. Yeah, that kind of looks good, man. That's fantastic. Won't last long, but it looks great. I appreciate you doing that. When he or she goes there, boom. You know what I mean? He's yeah. not being a picky wicky. He's not being or she's not being a you know a persnippity. She's not looking for something you didn't do. They're looking for ways to say, hey, I appreciate all you did. And when it comes to resiliency, I think the other thing we have going for us is most firefighters will celebrate your success. There's a huge and growing segment of our society that hates to see other people succeed. Um, we, we, we had a really horrible uh, experience over the weekend with a uh, there, there's a wonderful book by a guy named Milner, M-I-L-N-E-R. Uh-huh. And, and in it, he talks about America spelled backwards as if we were a strange tribe in a foreign land. And we thought that words had magic power. And if you could say things, it was like a chant and things would happen. And he's basically, you know, it, it's basically an interesting perspective. I highly recommend you take a look at it. Wonderful read. It's really for kids. But it has, it's like Gulliver Travels. Gulliver Travels, people think it's a children's book. It's anything but a children's book. Same things with the Chronicles of Narnia or Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. All of those books have much deeper, subtle meanings that the, the authors meant to deliver and did deliver with, with power and intensity. So I think when we talk about the privilege of being an American firefighter, the privilege of being a person that men and women can call on in good times and bad, um, a, a person that they know is going to treat them with respect and dignity, irrespective of who they are, their past misdeeds, or even their current misdeeds. You know, we rolled out one time on a shooting on Christmas Eve at a Payless shoe store, and and the Payless clerk decided to pull a gun to protect the twenty seven ninety five this guy was stealing or whatever. This is a Payless shoe store. They're not selling, you know, high-end shit this is cheap shoes right yeah yep on christmas eve the bad guy has a gun so the good guy pulls a gun they shoot each other and and they both died but when we got there they were both still viable so we split our team and we start working on both of them and my cop buddy said hey that's the shooter why are you guys wasting energy on him and, and i i had to explain to him that that's not how we roll uh you know we don't care what he did you know that's not for us to judge if he's the most viable patient, that's where 90% of our, our energy is going. You know, if the other guy is already dead, we can't do anything there. And, and I can't remember exactly how they, you know, what condition they were years ago. Um, but 
but anyway, I remember having a talk with that cop and he said, wow, that's really interesting. You guys really, that's really how you guys are. I said, yeah, we, you know, we, <clears throat> we don't, we don't care. You know, we don't care what they did. That's not our job. That's your job. You know, you, you gotta, you gotta arrest the right person. You know, we don't, we don't have to do that. We just have to try to save their lives. could almost say that's the spiritual piece of firefighting as well, right? It's like, we're not judging. We're just there to, to help uh, another human being. Yeah. I, I think, I think you're exactly right. It, and to me, it is spiritual and, and I make no bones about it. Um, I, I think there's a spiritual component to life. I, I think that within every human being, there's a, there's a tremendous spirituality. I, I think it's a, there's a soul. I believe there's a soul. Mm -hmm. I believe we're all connected in, in some greater way. And, and you can say it in whatever kind of language you want. I've got friends that are kind of semi mystics. You know, I lived in New Mexico for a long time. I understand, you know, a lot of the culture there and that has that type of feeling. I've got, I've got friends who are, are very uh, secular and, and yet nonetheless, they feel very connected to people. And that's another way to describe it, right? That we are our brother's keepers, you know? And, and so for me, it's a, it's a much more concretely religious framework, but for others who don't have it that way, it doesn't mean that they don't feel it right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Spiritualism isn't unique to Jews and Catholics and Buddhists and <clears throat> uh, Muslims. It's, it's, it's kind of a universal construct. And, um, and I think it's an important one. I think that being spiritual, again, to resilience and leadership is helpful. I, I think that there's five pillars in my, in my world, and I'm stealing this from my friend J.C. Keneally, um, who kind of put it down. He said, there, there's faith, family, focus, fitness, and finance. Mm -hmm. And if those five pillars are in pretty good shape in your life, to quote Piaget, you're going to fit in with uh, society, right? Piaget thought in a well-ordered society, if you're contributing and fit in well, that your life will be fairly ordered. You'll be fairly comfortable. You'll be fairly happy. You'll be, you know, you'll be fairly um, connected, right? Resilient. So Piaget um, kind of nailed it there. But the faith part, I think, is a big part of that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and however you want to express it, I'm not, you know, I'm not here to judge anybody. I'm just, or, or say that, you know, Catholicism is the only way to go. It is for me. And that's important that you find what it is for you, right? Even within my, my sons, not, not all are Catholic and, and that's fine. Um, you know, they've chosen not to continue to practice the faith. You know, that's, that's fine. Young people tend to do that. They, they drift away and then they come back, you know? And, uh, if you have drifted away from your faith, I don't care if it's Episcopalian or Methodist or whatever it is or whatever it is, and, and you feel a call, don't ever, don't, hesitate, don't ever hesitate to go back. Cause mm -hmm. you know, if it's the, if the, it's the right kind of church or synagogue or temple, they're going to say, welcome back. You know, how you doing? You know what I mean? Uh, th there's no harm, no foul. Like, you know, that, sure. I, I don't know how I got there, Dave. I apologize. <laughs> I think I led you there with that spirituality question. And, uh, you know, we've talked about it on this show. We've done uh, sort of a documentary episode about it. And we've had responders from police, fire, EMS, um, even dispatch who talk about their spirituality quite openly. And if we started to realize there are a lot more deeply spiritual people in emergency services than at least I thought uh, before. So uh, it seems like an integral part of what people maybe draws people into it in the first place. Well, because I think we are very aware of our mortality, whereas most people aren't. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if you're a first responder, you know that backing out of your driveway, some idiot can come down the block and take you out, boom, because you've seen it. You exactly. Know, yep. you, you've, you've responded to places where people say, 
hey, he was just walking along and down he went. And and there's a 25, 35, 45 year old person laying on the ground who two seconds earlier was fine. Yeah. You know, I have a neighbor, 44 years old, passed away a few weeks ago from a major uh, intracranial bleed. And uh, day before, fine. An hour before, fine. Complained of a headache and was dead. And so, you know, you don't know the hour. And for, for me, I, I think that to your point, as, as first responders, medics, cops, firefighters, we go to that all the time. So we realize there, there before the grace of God goes us, for whom the bell tolls, you know, to quote Dunn, Sonnet 17, one of the most poorly written sonnets ever, but really beautiful. Um, it, he got dinged a lot on his on the way he did the sonnet by the people who know how to do sonnets. I don't know poop about sonnets. But when you read that sonnet, which I think is just beautiful, he, he gets the crap beat out of him by the purists. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, oh, you're not doing that. That's not exactly right. You know, like, oh, sounds good to me. You know? Yeah. Sounds like he nailed it. Um, well, this kind of brings me to something that um, I think is definitely near to my heart. And that's in the fire service in particular. Um, I've lost brothers to cancer. Some of them are in some ways irreplaceable people in the sense that they made huge contributions in fire and EMS and training. And, you know, when we lose them, we feel like uh, there's a hole where they, they used to be. And we know that um, there's a huge percentage of names on the IFF fallen firefighter wall that are uh, members that died from occupational cancer. So what, what are we doing well in terms of cancer awareness and then where can we improve? Well, okay. We're doing well with our awareness of it and where we're doing our awareness is fantastic. And I think that, that we're at the beginning of the beginning. In other words, you know, we've been talking about it now for about 30 years, you know, um, mm -hmm. firefighter cancer. I was laughing because I pulled up an old PowerPoint that I had and it was, it was dated 19, uh, I think 74, 75, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, so we've been looking at, look at the McMaster study. I think the McMaster study was 84, 85, um, highly flawed, but, but a good starting point, right? We are, are, it's interesting. Most, most scientific papers, are, are highly flawed. People don't know realize that, but the people who who check those things out for a, for a living will tell you that most scientific flaws, scientific papers, about eighty five percent of them have flawed premises, have bad math, have have fudged conclusions, have are just and the worst places are psychology and sociology. They're absolutely the worst. If you want to read a good guy on it, his name is Desmet. Um, he has a book on uh, about totalitarianism out right now, uh, understanding totalitarianism, and it's a, he talks a lot about mass formation psychosis. But in it, he he's a mathematician, a Norwegian fellow, <clears throat> and he knows the folks who study papers. And most papers are garbage. So we the the care that I'm trying to get to is that like in the Lemaster study, there was claims that like we're 56 times more likely than the general population to get, say, prostate cancer. Hmm. Okay. Well, look at that statistic. What's the general population look like? 50% female, right? And you're talking about the general population. You're talking about all races, creeds, nationalities, right? When you look at the fire service, what do we look like? And I hate to say it, but you and I represent about 99.9% .9 of the fire service. Well, maybe mm -hmm. not nine, but you know what I mean? 98% arguably, maybe 95, I don't know. Let's say 95, right? White males. Mm -hmm. Who has the highest rate of prostate cancer? It would be us. There you go. And yeah. then if you dig down, if 50% is female, you got to deduct that right from the start. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of studies, they don't. Well, they don't have prostates, for God's sakes. So they're not going to have prostate cancer. So Benjamin Disraeli nailed it when he said lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? You know, you can you can get numbers to say whatever you want. That's the big moral hazard I think is out there for us, right? Mm -hmm. We have to be very, very careful about prescribing or about saying that something was work related, right? Uh, now, a lot of presumptive laws say prostate cancer is, is work related, good for them. I can't prove or disprove it. Um, but if you're a man, and, and trust me, I know a little bit about prostate cancer. Um, if, if you're a man, 
you're going to get it if you live long enough, more than likely. Um, it's in you somewhere. Mm-hmm. It yeah. just it just hasn't been activated yet. And, and it's not right or wrong or good or bad. It's just part of nature. And so what we're doing good about cancer is much heightened awareness, right? Don't breathe smoke. If you can avoid it, don't breathe smoke, right? Like, like we have to tell people that it's like, it's like saying, don't hit yourself in the head with a hammer. Yeah. You know, um, some friends of mine, quick anecdotal story, which kind of illustrates the point. We're on this group from the, from FEMA about messaging. And so one of my friends put up a thing about this ad that some obscure phone company put out there, which was a parody or a takeoff on National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. And it had grandpa on the chair and the Christmas tree and the dog with the burning turkey and the, and the mom talking to grandpa and the, the Christmas tree catches fire. And, 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 and I, and I can't even tell you what the messaging was supposed to be, but there you have it. That was the big, that was the big uh, deal about that particular ad. And my buddy got all upset about it. And, and he was like, look at this disregard carelessness with fire. And I'm like, okay. And everybody else jumped on, like there's like 70 people on this thing, you know, jumped on it. And I think they actually pressured the people to take the dang ad down. Cause they did. I checked and, and I'm like, okay, it's just funny. It's just stupid. You know what I mean? Uh, we run tremendous moral hazard when we assume, you know, that you know, we're more, you know, we've got a morally superior view of fire safety and you should never do an ad that nobody's, nobody who saw that was going to say, oh, I'm going to roll a flaming turkey under my Christmas tree. <laughs> you, you know, and the dog does it, by the way, in the commercial. I mean, oh, yeah. Just right. like right out of National Lampoon, right? <laughs> so I looked at this and I thought, man, get the, get the Volkswagen out of your ass, pal, because you're way overthinking this shit. But that's where we are today. Like we've gotten to this place and that's my point about the cancer. Cancer is horrible, but we don't know where a lot of it comes from yet. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, occupational cancer is, it, 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 it's, it's a, it's a fact that remains to be proven. And, and a lot of the, you know, mesothelioma, we got direct correlation there. You know, a lot of the lung cancers we, we know, but we don't know about all of them. And all I'm saying is let's, you know, let's be careful about, because let's be careful about what we, let's be careful about victimology. You know what I mean? Um, there's a great book out now by uh, dis, um, Ving Shanae. I can never get his, Ving is his first name, uh, mm-hmm. called Nation of Victims. Great book. Uh, I apologize. I love to read. So if that's bothering anybody at this point. I'm, I'm no, sorry. we have to put together a list for the show notes so of can everybody yeah, can I, it's find it's called Nation of Victims. Can't, I can't recommend it more highly. Wonderful book. Um, uh, just, a, just a wonderful, wonderful book. Also, Critical Theories, another great book you want to read. Just an absolutely brilliant book. Um, so, so anyway, I, I think with cancer, you know, eat well, get get checked. You know, I, I, I was in yesterday, you know, doing my thing. Um, I, I go regularly, uh, you know, but if I don't care how old you are, uh, don't avoid the digital for years. Uh, while I was in Albuquerque, I found that one of the docs was very popular and I was kind of like, why? And, and the guys all said, well, you know, he doesn't do the digital. He just says, ah, oh, you're probably okay. He doesn't do the digital. And, and, and if any of the gals are listening, that 
that means that the doc has to insert his fingers into our rectum to feel our prostates to see if it's normal sized or if it's swollen. And, and it's uncomfortable. And, and, you know, when you're young and it's the first time you've done it, or the first, you, you, even, even at my age, I've, and I've had it done, you know, a million times, but it, it's still, it's not the most dignified thing you're ever going to put right. yourself through. But it's really it's what, probably, 10 seconds long, 15? Yeah, maybe? it's 10 seconds long. And, and it's probably tougher for the doc. But it's important. It's really, really important. And, and uh, because swelling can key the doc in to look for other things. And, and, uh, uh, and it could just be benign swelling. It might mean just a change of diet. It might mean, you know, who knows what it might mean. But it's, my point is that the guys in Albuquerque, and it was all guys because it was the prostate exam, were all going to this doc because he wasn't doing that, right? And, oh, Oh, I got upset because um, that's I, I'm, I'm a prostate cancer survivor, so it was a big, big deal to me. And and also the term survivor is one that I always worry about with moral hazard because you're a you're a cancer person in remission. You're a cancer person who currently the disease isn't. Uh, uh, grossly obvious and i know dave right. you are as well yeah and survivor you know connotes that it's it's a done deal right that you're you're yeah it's, it's never a done it, it's yeah. never a done deal boys and girls i hate to, to break that to you but it's never a done deal um it's something you just live with and it's yeah. not good or bad or right or wrong and you're not a victim you know uh it, it gives you a chance like are you in any groups dave where you get treated um well i I've been involved with some uh, support groups. If that's yeah, support true. groups. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Aren't those great? Because yeah. in a support group, everybody gets to help everybody else. Again, it's about helping others. It's about purpose. Yes. You know, and, and so, uh, you know, and, and they're tough groups because uh, every now and then you're in group with somebody who doesn't make it. And uh, yeah, my wife, um, she runs a cancer caregiver support group where, um, so these are, you know, husbands, wives who are caring for a spouse who's, you know, basically um, probably in their last, you know, the last stretch of uh, of life. And some of the stories um, she hears are heartbreaking, but that group has magic. The support that they give each other and the ways that they come through for each other and lift each other up is is incredible. And the amazing resilience of those people, right? Mm -hmm. the, the Bible says, iron sharpens iron as a man's countenance sharpens his friend. And, and, and the, your countenance means your character. Mm -hmm. So your character is going to make your, your fellow uh, uh, firefighter a better person, your spouse, your children. Their character is going to make you a better person. When they said iron sharpens iron, that was the beginning of the metaphor mm -hmm as a man's countenance sharpens that of his friend. Mm -hmm. And and that's the important part of that. People always iron sharpens iron and they leave it there, but it's the rest of the quote that matters, you know? Yes, and, yeah. uh, and, and so to, to your point about cancer, which is I know incredibly important to you and, and folks you're associated with, and me too, I get it. Um, the two things I would recommend to people, don't let it own you. Don't let it define you, you know, you're not, you're not a person with cancer. You're just a person who's living with it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, don't, you know, don't constantly bring up, you know, what you're taking or, you know, whatever. Cause you know, there can be a lot of drama in the whole cancer. Yeah, there's a ton of drama. Deal. Yeah. Right. And then, and then I, I, and then, and then to those of you who haven't had cancer yet, when you meet somebody, don't, don't look at us like you have tombstones in your eyes. You know what I mean? Like we're not going to die right now. And odds are we're going to get shot climbing out of some girl's bedroom window. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's the old, old male joke about how they want to die. So yeah, get over it. But or 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 get shot, climb out of some guy's bedroom window. You know, there you go. There you go. You, you, you know, fair I mean? and balanced. The yeah, fair and balanced, fair <laughs> and balanced humor. Um, so I think that the odds are something else might get you, or maybe not, and that's okay too. You know what I mean? Sure. Nobody gets out alive. What um, bringing this fire service back into this conversation? Um, when I was diagnosed, you know, of course, my wife was with there there with me, and I it was I was shocked, but. You know, I probably didn't even hear the doctor say stage four cancer. I just heard cancer. And that was, I kind of like shut down at that point. But I can remember like the most important thing now that my wife and kids knew was going to the firehouse and getting the shift in the kitchen and 
basically it was it was an uncomfortable moment for me but i felt it was really important to say you know guys I feel like i got to tell you i'm going to be out for the next 4 or 5 months i kind of felt like i was letting them down but i wanted them to know this is what's happening and you know i really kind of you know hope you're going to be there to support me but mostly i'm sad that i'm not going to be there to support you guys and it was hard i was like the poster child for nutrition and you know working out good health and here i am telling them you know i've got cancer and from there mike mike put his arm around me and he said you know i've been through something similar and just take it one step at a time you know and that was the beginning of this outpouring of support that we do in the fire family where you know they they helped me get through that you know grueling kind of four or five months of um, treatment and you know that's where we're blessed too, right? To be part of that uh, firefighter family community. Yeah, the the Cancer Support Network, which I'm very proud to be associated with. My friend Mike DeBron was mm-hmm. the founder of it. Uh, Mike's retired now. He's living on a ranch somewhere in Wyoming or Montana, something like that. Like all Californians, he escaped and went to a free state. Um, the, 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 the California wall does have breaks in it that you guys can slip through if you want sometimes. If, if you're lucky, you can get out. You can't get a U-Haul. You can't get a U-Haul. Yeah. You got you to bring it in. You got to bring it in. To get <laughs> it's to one way. It. It, they're one way. Isn't that hysterical? <laughs> yeah, nobody's bringing them back to California. Um, but um, so Mike started it. And that was the whole point of the Firefighter Cancer Support Network. And anybody out there who's listening, there's tons of resources out there, millions. And, and they're one of the best. They do a great job. You'll get a package. Uh, you'll get connected. Brian Frieders is currently our president. He's an incredibly beautiful human being. Um, and, and and even those guys, I think the thing there that, that Dave was talking about earlier is we have to be careful about making sure we take care of the caretakers, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because when you talk about the men and women who are taking care of a spouse or a child going through cancer, man, that takes a toll. I mean, that's a, an incredibly rough thing. Um, my sister was an oncology nurse for 40 years, over 40 years mm-hmm. at Sloan Kettering. And um, one of the most beautiful human beings on the face of the planet. But for her entire life, she's carried that pain for people and helped people in the final stages of their lives, um, you know, s- stay connected, be connected, um, face death, um, uh, which is amazing. Uh, and I- I've never met anyone um I've never met anyone with that kind of uh, resiliency before since then. And maybe, you know, I'll brag on her because she's my sister, but probably the most resilient woman I've ever met mm-hmm. and and the most saintly in, in a religious sense. And one of the things in resiliency is that we have to recruit the right people, right? And, and Dave knows I've written a great deal on this recently, mm-hmm. is that with this current, what we're calling recruitment crisis, I see it completely the opposite. I, I see it as probably the greatest recruiting time in the history of the fire service and other professions, because we're getting the people who know who we are. We're getting the people who know it's not easy. We're getting the people who know a lot is going to be demanded of you. You know, in the, in the Bible, Jesus says from those that much is given, much will be expected. And we are looking for the people with incredible talent an incredible drive, a kind of a relentless, aggressive drive towards serving others and being the best they can possibly be. Um, and at the same time, being completely unsure as to whether or not they're good enough. Does that make sense? Sure. Mm-hmm. And it's in a landscape of, a, of our lives, our, our country, our world that's changing dramatically and dynamically on a daily basis. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you and I both have these devices, right? They didn't exist when I took this job at fire engineering. They mm. didn't exist. Wow. And I've only been here 18 years, you know? Uh, so, which is not a long time in the arc of history, mm-hmm. you know, to some people, oh, 18 years. No, that's a blip on the radar screen. You know, um, that's nothing. Epidemiologically, you know, they talk in millennia, you know, which is a thousand freaking years. 20 years is absolutely nothing. And so when you look at the impact of that, you know, people talk about, you know, the the printing press and people talk about radio and television and all these mediums. This medium is is even more fascinating. Not that it's kind of incorporated a lot of that into it, like radio, television, 
printing. It's kind of all in one, mm-hmm. but it's mobility is what makes it different. It's accessibility is what makes it different. Like 20 years ago, before this thing came out, if you went for a hike in the woods or Yellowstone or, or Arches or even the Appalachia Trail, you were on a hike, bro. You, you were not connected. You were, right. you were basically one with nature. Mm-hmm. Now, if you take this, you're not. And it's interesting because people say, well, what if something happens? I need to be able to call for help. Okay. So one of the things I like to do is go places without it, mm-hmm. you know, like that, you know, go, go kayak and go hike and go, you know, even if I'm taking my dog for a walk, I don't take my damn phone. You know what I mean? I, Cause I want to, I want to talk to my dog and he talks back. Just kidding. It's a big, <clears> son, <throat> of, big son of Sam reference, which is probably a bad reference. <laughs> yeah. I can remember the, uh, the headlines now in the daily news. Well, Chief, we've um, we've covered some ground today, and I I really so appreciate you being here to um, have this conversation. It's um, it's been something I've been looking forward to for a long time, and you are always uh, full of amazing uh, inspiration and insight into lots of things having to do with the fire service. So, uh, thank you for being with us. But I want to thank you for what you're doing. Um, thank you for raising the not only the cancer side of it, but the mental health and the wellness and, and just resiliency in general, because it's a, uh, it's a virtue that I think we need to talk about. And it's truly a virtue. Uh, I think that's the word to use. Hmm. Too often today, people use the word value and no one knows what that means. Is that how much it costs? Is that you know what, what it's worth? But virtue, we understand. Hmm. And, and virtue is something that we should um, work on and, 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 and embrace and try to, uh, uh, promote yeah, and the, the, yeah. the virtue of resilience is an important virtue. And, and thank you for being the tip of the spear in, in those conversations. And um, if we can ever do anything for you, we'd love to have you at FDIC. If you want to come out and jump on one of the shows at FDIC or take up an hour, we'd love to have you come talk about resilience. If you want to, we've got a, we're going to be doing um, podcasts like this uh, live from FDIC. So um, Fantastic. Well, thank you again. It's been a real pleasure and I uh, look forward to seeing you there in uh, Indianapolis. Thank you. God bless. Have a great Thanksgiving. All right. You as well.